To understand this assertion, one must realize that what most people think to be hate and to be love are not, are not really the essence of love and hate that they think them to be. For most people, love is an emotion, a feeling that proceeds from the heart in response to a person or a thing or a situation that has aroused favorable, positive desires within you. But this emotional type of love lasts only as long as the feeling lasts. And the feeling lasts only as long as the stimulus continues to arouse positive desire. Real love, and the New Testament original has a special word for it that, you're heard, that you've heard and are familiar with, agape. Real love is not based in the emotions and the feelings of the body, though it certainly has the power to affect them. Real love, that which is God's very nature, proceeds from the soul, the part of us that is made in God's image. It does not wither and die when its uh, object proves to be unworthy or trifling. With this premise established as axiomatic, I'll proceed from it with an assertion that I am convinced is biblically attested, and that is that the opposite of love is really selfishness. That is the spiritual attitude that is most unlike that of Christ, and it's the greatest hindrance to reaching heaven. Every person faces an existential dichotomy, self or God. Selfishness by its very nature places the self before God. It seeks to satisfy self first and leave God out of consideration or else to give him seconds. Exalting God before self places consideration for what God wants first, most important and most precious in everything even in our own supposed welfare. If asked to make a list of the blackest and foulest and most terrible sins, you would probably list these in some order. Murder, cruelty, child abuse, sexual abuse, drunkenness, drug abuse, and stealing. But I myself am convinced otherwise. I contend that raw, Naked selfishness is worst of all. Careful examination will show, I think, that selfishness is the root from which all these other abominable sins spring forth. Any sin that is named in Scripture can be traced in it to its conception in selfishness. Moreover, selfishness can, uh, sustains every sin. It's the nourishment upon which every sin feeds and maintains itself. To believe this, remember that whatever is contrary to God's nature is sin. Whatever is contrary to His will, whatever is contrary to His definition is sin. When anyone chooses to oppose God's nature, to reject God's will, and to decide sin for himself, what is that person really doing? Isn't he placing his own nature before God's? Isn't he claiming his own will to be more important than God's? And isn't he declaring his own view of morality to be superior to God's? It's obvious that selfishness is the guiding motive behind all of that. The person is facing again that existential dichotomy, self or God, and is making a choice, self. I'm fully convinced 
that our greatest enemy is not Satan without us. It's rather our own tendency to put ourselves before all else, even God. And that is ultimate selfishness. Satan cannot bother anyone as long as that person trusts in God rather than himself and places total dependence upon God. Satan, to be sure, is more powerful than any of us. And anyone who decides to live apart from God is exposing himself to Satan's superiority. It might just be that we have uh, ignored this enemy within us in our teaching and even more in our daily living and giving Satan thereby the opportunity to take control. Then he refuses to allow us to reveal his influence in our thought and speech and behavior. I'm convinced that raw selfishness is the major problem that the Bible addresses from Genesis to Revelation. Man fell in Eden when he first exercised selfishness. Jesus came as the model of unselfishness. And what was his motto? Your will be done, not mine. Now I ask you to turn with me to the reading a moment ago, Matthew 16. And in the rest of our lesson, we're going to focus upon verse 24 there. Because in it, Jesus says something that goes right to the heart of the subject I have brought before us. There he said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus is here talking about what is required to become and then continue to be his disciple or what is equivalent to be a Christian. This is a matter of greatest concern to us because we know that our eternal welfare depends upon that identity. When we extend the gospel call to become a disciple of Jesus, we point out that there are five steps that one must take. First, he must hear the word of God. He must believe that. He must repent of his sins. He must confess his faith in Christ Jesus, and then he must be buried with Christ in baptism. This is undeniable because there is abundant scripture giving both command and clear example that each one of these steps is essential. None can be omitted and no other pathway can lead us into the kingdom of heaven. There is nothing else that we can offer and nothing other that we would dare propose. Any alteration is of human will, and nothing from man can stand in the counsel of God. But in following these five steps, it's essential to know and understand what we're doing. One might easily answer and would, I know what I'm doing, and I understand it, and I'm doing what must be done in order to become a Christian. And on one level, that would be entirely true. That is indeed what is being done. However, like so much else, this essential prescription can be reduced to a mechanical process. One knows what to do, but sometimes it can be questioned if the person really and truly understands it. Let me give an illustration or, uh, from my own profession of teaching math for more than 40 years. In the course of calculus, I taught students how to differentiate a linear function. You take the exponent of a term and multiply it by the coefficient and reduce the exponent by one, and you do that term by term right across the function. It's not too difficult to learn that rule. 
and apply it. And then the student can successfully differentiate linear functions. But the knowledge and application for the great majority of students is purely mechanical. Only the most perceptive students understand what is mathematically going on as they are applying that rule. You see, the genius of the mathematics in involved is like a program that is running in the background unseen that makes that rule work. So we produce students who are functional, and that's great. But they aren't mathematicians, even though they may receive the coveted grade of A at the end of the course. Likewise, we uh, lead a person through the five steps to becoming a Christian, and when they complete it, they are indeed a Christian, a disciple of the Lord Jesus. But there is something else going on that transcends the mechanics of that action. And in this case, if the person does not understand that, he or she is not going to succeed in living the Christian life because something at the core essential is not there. And the underlying reality that gives meaning to these five steps and that will hold a person true and loyal in living the Christian life is what Jesus reveals there in Matthew 16 and verse 24. If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. His first words there, <clears throat> if anyone will come after me, refers <clears throat> excuse me, to becoming a Christian. One becomes a Christian to follow Jesus in all aspects of life. You cannot follow Jesus only on Sunday. Following Jesus is a 24-7 proposition. <clears throat> you must, so to speak, see him before you, wherever you go and whatever you do. You aren't following Christ if he is behind you or if even if he is beside you. What am I saying? If Jesus is beside you, you're treating him as an equal. You equivocate with him to agree with what you're doing, where you're going, and what you're expecting to experience. If Jesus is behind you, you're telling him that your direction, your activities, and your desires are right. You're supposedly convincing him that your interpretation of right and wrong is the correct one. But folks, one becomes a Christian, here in Jesus' own words, to come after me, that is, to follow him. He's not a buddy at your side, democratically deciding the way of life with you to go. And he's never behind you, being persuaded by you that everything is going to work out right if you lead the way and make the decisions. To become a Christian means to follow behind him. And that's when he is in front and you are behind. Where to go is his choice. What to do is his decision. And the expected rewards in life are his to determine. Now, fellow Christians and friends and folks, that is the antithesis of selfishness. Becoming a Christian essentially means to submit to Christ in every aspect of your life. And every is highlighted with a line under it. There are many places where people commonly go that Christ would never lead you because the nature of the place there is contrary to Christ's nature. And there are many activities that people commonly engage in that Christ would never undertake 
because they are contrary to the model of conduct that he left us. Nevertheless, even Christians sometimes go where they want to go and do what they want to do and seem to be not especially concerned whether Christ will approve it or not. Now, so far in Matthew 16, 24, we've considered only the first clause. If, it, if anyone wishes to come after me, now let's look at that second clause, which is so important. Let him deny himself. What did Jesus just say there? Did he say, deny yourself? Indeed, that's what he said. And what does that mean? It simply means that you do not do what you want to do, but rather in any given situation what the Lord would have you to do. Is that the choice that the typical Christian makes? Actually, it is. Sometimes, part of the time, let's face it and admit it, some days we're more spiritual than we are others. And on those days, we yield to Christian conduct and activity rather than please ourselves. Those are the good days of our lives. But on other days, we are more worldly. We choose to follow a course to please ourselves. We choose to engage in activities that are entertaining and socially satisfying. You see, we just want sometimes to relax, to let our hair down and blow in the wind. When I was a teen, and I can still remember it, believe it or not, there was a very popular song by a young man named Buddy Knox that was entitled Party Doll. The first line of it went, every man's got to have a party doll to be with him when he's feeling wild. The idea was that every man has his days when he is inclined to feel wild. And then he needs the proper company to make it happen. And the same is true for girls and women. But folks, that is nothing but raw selfishness. It's surrendering to one's lower carnal nature. And it's the opposite to Christ's requirement to deny yourself. The Bible gives us examples of people who we think of as Bible heroes who usually lived uprightly, but one day, and it's recorded, the person began to feel wild and gave in to their lower carnal nature. I could choose many examples, but just one. And that is King David. The man we love to say over and over was a man after God's own heart. But folks, he wasn't every day that he lived. One day that's recorded he began to feel wild, and he began to look around for that party doll. He didn't have to look very long or very far. A man usually doesn't. You see, just over the wall from his palace, he saw an utterly beautiful creature enjoying a warm bath right out in the open in the balmy sunshine. Her name was, I guess, musical, Bathsheba. It made no difference to David that she was the wife of Uriah. You see, she was the party doll that he needed right then to fulfill his urge in feeling wild. So he sent for her, and to her shame, she came willingly and very readily and then David hung a do not disturb sign on the door to his private chamber. And then he satisfied the wild urge within him to the fullest. 
Brethren, that was the very same David who on another day penned in Psalm 19, verse 24, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. David wrote that on a day when he was spiritual, when his heart was tuned to God and his feelings were under tight control. It reveals the mood of self-denial, for look at what he is praying, that his speech and his mind be acceptable unto God. The case of David well shows that even a man of God in subjection to God's will can easily one day abandon himself to his lower passionate nature and pursue self-gratification. I hope that no one listening to me this morning has ever done what David did and never will. But there are other selfish expressions that you and I have committed and might commit again. There's one further point to be emphasized here in Jesus' statement in Matthew 16, 24, in the phrase, let him deny himself. That verb there, deny, is in the present tense, which in the original Greek language carries the idea not of present time so much as continuous, sustained action. And this simply, simply means that the idea of denying yourself for it to please God is to be continued without interruption, not like David. We must never allow an intermission and choose to do what pleases self when some appealing situation develops. To do that, folks, is what the Bible classifies as a willful sin. And in the Old Testament, it's called sinning with a high hand. We do it lightly, but God takes it very, very seriously. It's so easy to commit that transgression. Because you see, if you're a human being, self-will is strong within you. You know, often we choose to decide in a certain matter to do just what we want to do for once. That is, we want to please ourselves for a little while. And as we think it to be, to have some real fun for a few minutes. But you know, folks, when you decide to satisfy your own desire, surrendering God's will for just a little bit, what you're doing is you're putting yourself on your own. And believe me, Satan always sees that. And he comes rushing into your life right at that time. And he will carry you just as far away from God as he can. That's illustrated in the first sin when Eve disregarded God's will and ate of the fruit of that forbidden tree. What is it to eat an apple or an orange or a banana or a kumquat or whatever your favorite fruit is? It, it seems like it's nothing. But on that occasion, what seemed like a small deed was an enormous deed because it flooded the world with evil. It was the tiny fissure in the dam that quickly opened into a great spillway. It's the same when you or I decide to make what we think is a small exception and choose to feel wild for a short time. Wherever you are, I ask you to bow with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the model or marvel of electronic media which enables us this morning to enjoy a type of communion, though we are in many different places. We're sorry we aren't together in one place because of the danger of spreading the viral contagion sweeping through the country. We ask you 
if you will, to bring a swift cessation to it, even as you called halt to the pestilence in the time of David as it was approaching the edge of Jerusalem. We ask you to preserve the lives of those already infected and restore health to them. And then may we soon be able to assemble here together to worship you, to study your word, to fellowship person to person, and to resume programs of service that are now in suspension. Father, I pray also that this lesson I've just presented will penetrate and be indelibly imprinted upon the heart of everyone listening, even as I trust it did upon me while I was preparing it. May we learn to look outward from our own private circles into the broad areas of humanity about us and become more concerned about needs there which can only be met with the application of your gospel. May we recognize more than ever before that the gospel is to be shared in doing the deeds that you have ordained for us to do. Moreover, Father, I pray that we each will put ourselves behind the Lord Jesus in the daily routine walk of life. May we truly resign our will to yours in Christ realizing that you will accept us fully only when we do. Bless us where we're trying. Forgive us where we aren't. And be merciful to us as we learn to deny ourselves and truly yield our lives to you in Christ. We thank you that we may speak to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. It may be that some of you listening this morning realize spiritual needs that you want to address without further hindrance or hesitation. Perhaps you want to put on Christ in baptism to become truly his disciple, a Christian indeed. Or perhaps you want to repent of sin as a failing Christian and wish the prayers of the church for your forgiveness. In whatever case, please call the number that has been provided and someone will assist you. I thank you most sincerely for giving me your attention this morning. Again, may God bless you all. <laughs>